Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, bienvenidos, bienvenidos a uh, todas y todos to this second session of the webinar. Uh, my name is Eduardo Castillo Vinuesa. I'm head curator here at Media Lab and I will be hosting the session today. If you're joining us today for the first time, um, for you to know the objective of these sessions is to present the eight selected projects that uh, we will be developing here at Media Lab during our upcoming collaborative prototyping laboratory in the context of our first lab called Medio Sintientes. For those that don't know about this, uh, the Collaborative Prototyping Lab is a two week intensive workshop that we will be carrying out here in Media Lab between the 21st of April and the 4th of May in collaboration with three mentors, uh, Abelardo Ficournier, Nerea Calvillo, and the artistic duo Quadratu. They will be the ones to, that supervise and tutorship the development of these eight amazing projects that, that we have selected to a public and international open call for promoters during the last few months. But we are not done yet. As its own name shows, uh, the Collaborative Developing Lab is a collaborative endeavor, uh, which is why we just launched it uh, some weeks ago our second open call looking up for collaborators. People that want to join us here in Madrid to help us out to develop these projects. For those interested in the call, I think it's important to say that the Media Lab offers collaboration fellowships to cover the travel plus accommodation expenses of eight collaborators with independence of his or her place of origin. So if it doesn't matter if you apply from South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, or even inside of Spain, uh, we will cover all the expenses to bring the selected people during two weeks here to Madrid uh, to participate in, in the workshop. Um, this open call is currently ongoing and it will be open until the 3rd of April. Um, if you need more information about this, um, um, make sure to check out our website, both our uh, website Media Sintientes, but also the website of Media Lab Matadero for more information. Maybe we can type uh, the, the address here in the, in the chat of YouTube. Um, yeah, and you will find more information about the open call there. Uh, so today, we will cover the remaining four projects, following up the amazing four that were introduced in these three sessions. Uh, it's important to say that we will be answering questions. This is a live event, so both questions, even if they are specific for the project, but also if you guys have any questions regarding the process of the open, of the open call or any question for the guest speaker that I want to have today, make sure to type the questions in the, in the chat in YouTube, and we will address them uh, during the presentations today. Similar to yesterday, uh, we have invited two amazing guest speakers for today's session two, which practice, we think, engage directly with some of the topics that we are dealing with uh, during the Medio Sintientes Lab. Also, we will be presenting today our second artist in residence, who will be doing a research project here in Media Lab during the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, our first guest is Carlos Vallot. Carlos is an architect and head of 3D laser scanning at Factum Arte, an adjunct professor at Columbia University. His work explores the technological and cultural processes that define the original qualities of objects, developing a contemporary approach to the conservation of artistic heritage through high resolution documentation and facsimile making, which are, for those that doesn't know, exact rematerialization of a work of art. He works on numerous projects, including the first high resolution digitalization of the Tom of Seti, the first in Luxor, Egypt, as well as artistic documentation in major museums. He organizes exhibitions such as the installation of the Faximiles of the Town of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings and of the Sala Bologna in the Palazzo de Poli. A speaker and organizer of various seminars, as well as guest lecturer at various institutions. So, Thank you so much, Carlos, for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo. Can you hear me? Yes. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you to all the team in um, Media Lab Matadero, and congratulations so far for the work you are doing. I would like to share my screen now. Um, let me know if it works. I will be talking about the, the work that the uh, Factum Foundation uh, is doing, especially in Venice. As, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, we are uh, developing works actually on a global uh, scale. We've been working a lot in Egypt, 
Uh, we work with different museums, with different cultural institutions. Um, but I want to focus today on the way we are using digital technologies for understanding how Venice works today. I want to first introduce a little bit about who we are. So we are based in Madrid and um, Factum Arte and Factum Foundation are kind of sister organizations because Factum Arte is dedicated to uh, producing works of art for contemporary artists. We give them technical solutions to what they want to do to materialize their ideas. So here are some pictures of our studios in Madrid. And we are working, for example, with um, artists like Anish Kapoor, Mark Quinn, Marina Abramovic, Carlos Gareco, Emmanuel Franquelo, etc. And uh, we are um, collaborating with them into making uh, the best out of the available technologies and new technologies for producing their ideas. At the same time, the Factum Foundation is dedicated to using these digital technologies for helping the preservation of cultural heritage and art in general. And in order to do that, we have been specialized in creating or developing our own systems, our own 3D scanners, our own um, color capture technologies, reproduction technologies, because what we are trying to achieve is uh, let's say that what it's possible to be done today and in the near future in order to preserve the cultural heritage, not just for today, but also for the future. One of the things that we are famous for is by making facsimiles, making exact replicas of works of art. So in this image in the studio, one of the uh, uh, printing tests that we have at the, at the back of this wall is a section of a painting by Veronese. I want to talk to you very quickly about this as an example of why and how we are uh, doing facsimiles to help the, prote the protection and preservation of cultural heritage. In order to do that, I want to start by this image. This is, um, this is something that until very recently, it was a common image in, let's say, the main museums in the world. This is an image in Paris, in the Louvre Museum. And all these people are gathering in order to look at the Mona Lisa. They are all trying to get a picture or a selfie in front of the Gioconda. And what is happening here is that in a way they are giving their backs, they are ignoring a much bigger painting, a much bigger canvas that is behind them, which is uh, The Wedding at Cana by Paolo Veronese. This painting that is sharing the same room as the Gioconda, it was not originally made to be shown in Paris. As you can imagine, this painting, uh, it was first made to be on display in Venice, in the island of San Giorgio. What happened is that um, in this space, the refectory that was designed by Palladio, as well as the main church in San Giorgio, San Giorgio Maggiore, all these spaces, all these monumental uh, spaces were meant to be part of a global understanding of art and architecture uh, that should be working all together according to the same principle, to the same concept. So this huge painting representing the wedding at Cana it used to be at the end of this refectory. This is where all the monks gathered to, to eat together. So uh, the representation of the first miracle of Christ, the wedding at Cana, it was in a way presiding this moment of uh, that they were uh, sharing together. What happened is that Napoleon took the painting. It actually had to rip it in different sections and took it to Paris. And since then, it's been on display in the Louvre Museum. We were asked about the possibility of making an exact replica of this painting. So it could be uh, in a way brought back to Venice, to its original context. We are not talking about any kind of virtual uh, representation or playing with projections on the wall. We were talking back then in 2007, 2008, we were talking about a physical reproduction, something you could actually touch. So the first thing in order to do that is how you document with digital technologies with the best possible um, 
photographic techniques at the highest possible resolution? How can you capture the qualities of that surface, the surface of the original painting, without any contact? We are talking about 100% uh, safe technologies for the original. So you could actually capture in the highest possible resolution the color and the material qualities of this huge canvas. We had to adapt existing technology. So for example, we took uh, one of those A4 uh, flatbed scanners that we have in offices or in any desk, and we had to mount it on top of a telescopic mast so we could record the full area uh, at a certain distance of a few centimeters from the surface, and then composing like a mosaic, like a collage of uh, small sections of the painting in very high resolution that then we could reunite together and combine together into one single file in very high resolution. This information, once we captured all the data that we need, and we are back in our studios in Madrid, we have to be able to rematerialize it physically, in this case by using digital printers, so we could print them on a canvas very similar to the original, so we are not talking about painting anything by hand, only the joints and minimal retouches that are necessary in order to, to complete uh, the huge size of a painting like this. So it's a reproduction, it's a replica. It is made by a combination of digital te technologies and craft traditional skills. And this is how it looks today if you visit the island of San Giorgio in Venice. You can see the refectory, you can see the space, and you can see that now it is complete with the painting that the artist, Paolo Veronese, um, designed to be uh, on display in this specific uh, setting. As you can see, some lines of the architecture that are represented in the painting are a continuation of the actual architectural motives in this space itself. And uh, what is more important is that you can see the painting at the right space, but also with the correct height without that uh, completely artificial golden frame as it's uh, on display in Paris. You can see it with the um, natural light from the windows, exactly how the artist envisioned this work of art. So at the end, all these characteristics combined together, they make something very special. They make something that when you are in front of this, even though you know it's, it's not the original, uh, even though you are completely aware that you are in front of a replica made in the 21st century, uh, even if it's not the original, maybe your experience is more authentic. So it is this idea of originality and authenticity that we are trying to challenge in every project that we are doing. Um, reproducing the surface of paintings is something that has been almost like an obsession for us. In the case of the painting in Venice, it was mostly about how to reproduce color. But then when we wanted to reproduce also the surface of a painting, like for example, the brush strokes or the texture of a canvas or a panel painting, it becomes uh, much harder or a completely different type of challenge. It is because of that that we designed our own 3D scanner specific for the surface of paintings and other low relief objects. The Lucida 3D scanner that is made in collaboration with the artist and engineer Manuel Franquelo is the result of this research. And uh, thanks to a system like this, it is possible, for example, to record the surface of a panel painting by Rubens, like this one in the Museo del Prado in Madrid, and obtain this type of information. It is possible to, in a way, ignore the color of the painting and look directly at the topographical qualities of a, of a painting. So we are starting to understand that it is not a flat image, that any painting in the world, it's actually a three-dimensional object, almost like a sculpture. And especially because we are talking about a 3D scanner in high resolution, it is possible to capture any differences in depth uh, to a level of a tenth of a millimeter. This is why we consider this scanner um, a high resolution scanner specifically developed for conservation of work, works of art. Over the years, we have been applying this scanner to studying all kinds of paintings from um, Renaissance artists to avant-garde to abstract painting, um, old masters, 
etc. And we have been learning to look at paintings without the color. So we are being very interested on, see, on seeing what is the type of information that you can obtain by looking at a painting under this light, looking as if it was really an um, aerial view of a landscape, almost like that. No? We also find out that this tool, it is a very interesting scanner as uh, education to learn, uh, especially for those students that are interested in learning new technologies for cultural preservation. Uh, this type of system is very intuitive to use and we have been applying it as part of uh, different training initiatives, like for example, with Columbia University, uh, also actually with um, the Technical School of Architecture in Madrid, where Eduardo is teaching, and also the School of Architecture in Venice. And it was a way, a good way of introducing students who will be the cultural managers, the cultural heritage managers of the future, how to understand why it is essential to document monuments and works of art in high resolution. Together with this uh, 3D scanner, we have been, of course, using high resolution photogrammetry to document not only paintings, but also the surface and the texture of sculptures and uh, also architectural elements. So at the end, we started to carry out a series of projects in Venice. All these images that I'm showing you now, they have been happening in Venice and especially in the island of San Giorgio in collaboration with the Fondazione Giorgio Cini, who are the managers of the island. They are uh, they have been creating a very interesting program of cultural activities and initiatives on the island. And especially they own a very important collection of um, not only works of art, but also books, manuscripts, uh, furniture, uh, and so on. So thanks to these initiatives, it has been possible to gather a proper archive, a proper digital archive of all the surface qualities, all those characteristics that are defining these works of art uh, so that we could have this documentation for the future. But the approach is always the same. It doesn't matter if we are recording a small painting or, uh, or a ceiling or part of, of a facade in an architectural scale. Also working in Venice, we had the opportunity of taking the students from New York to record this famous trophy wall. This is uh, part of the exterior facade of the um, Basilica of St. Mark's in Venice. And it is important because it's like a patchwork of uh, marbles and stones from different parts of the world. And uh, thanks to this combination of different techniques, including the 3D scanning technologies, but also photogrammetry, it was possible to gather this type of information, documents of the different panels uh, of the marble types with and without the color. So we could create this type of um, it's like a small archive of a small portion of the city of Venice, but it is uh, very relevant because it will allow in the future to kind of follow how this part of the city has been changing over time. It is possible to monitor different deteriorations of modi or modifications to a level of sub-millimeter resolution. We are not talking just about capturing the general shape of a building here but we are talking about the specific texture of one specific uh, marble stone. So after developing different recording technologies, and thanks to the collaboration with the Giorgio Cini Foundation, uh, we decided it was necessary to go one step uh, beyond. And then we made a partnership also with the Digital Humanities Lab at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in order to combine our own fields of expertise. So if Factum, we have been uh, specialized in developing different recording technologies, um, the Digital Humanities Lab in Lausanne, they have been specialized in extracting new knowledge out of digital information, thanks to artificial intelligence or other types of pattern recognition software. This is the the partnership of these three organizations made way to Archive, which is the new space in Venice dedicated to the analysis and recording of cultural heritage in Venice. So 
we started to look at how to record as much as possible of the cultural heritage in the island or in the city of Venice. We developed not only 3D scanners, but also a specific system for capturing um, huge amounts of uh, archival documents, like double-sided documents, for example, with the replica scanner. Uh, we were also collaborating with the Chini for recording manuscripts and other types of important books. And for example, because in Venice we have the um, state's archive, with uh, a huge amount of uh, archival records that have not really been studied um, uh, 100%, it was possible in collaboration with the Lausanne Polytechnic to develop this type of new uh, software for recognizing uh, common elements, not only in texts, but also in images. So by scanning uh, different archives from different collections, not only not only in the Chini Foundation, but also in other important archives in Venice, it was possible to not only to have a compilation of this information, but also to start establishing relations between images that art historians maybe they didn't consider initially. So thanks to this artificial intelligence software, it was possible to establish new relations, uh, establish links between images, texts, uh, and also maps. Studying the evolution of maps in Venice, it has been one of the important fields of research in archive, in this new venture that we have in collaboration with Lausanne. And uh, it is one of the best ways of understanding how Venice has been evolving over time. One very quick example is what we were doing with this heart-shaped Mapamundi that is located in the Biblioteca Marciana, in the, in the center, in the uh, St. Mark's Square in Venice. These uh, six uh, uh, planks of wood, they were preserved. We had the opportunity of scanning them with the Lucida 3D scanner. And then each of the planks, each of the 3D models, they were used as an exercise of digital restoration. We were doing exactly the same as a restorer would be doing with the originals, but on a digital uh, environment without ever touching the original. You can see some examples here of the 3D information before and after this process of restoration. So then we could try ways of rematerializing this data. There is always this uh, two-way trip between capturing information and then how you make this information physical again. So through different techniques of 3D printing, and uh, CNC milling, it was possible to recreate this, uh, each of these six planks again in a new material in order to create for the first time in, let's say, hundreds of years, uh, a new series of prints of this unique map. This example of digital restoration of a map that is located in Venice, that is part of the history of Venice, is one of the things that are possible to be done thanks to digital technologies. Um, it is also possible to record a painting like this one by Vittore Carpaccio, that it's called Two Venetian Ladies. And once we have the information, propose to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles to go and record the other painting that they have that uh, it has been separated from the one in Venice, but they were originally part of the same panel, which are now in different locations. So thanks to digital techniques and to rematerialization as facsimiles, it should be possible to make a new version of these original works in which the two halves are reunited again. This is a detail showing that even though each panel has its own restoration history and therefore its own aspect, uh, they actually belong one on top of the other. Um, of course, this technology, as I was mentioning at the beginning, it's important if you want to make a facsimile of something. So for instance, this um, painting by Titian that is part of, um, um, of the, um, also part of the Museo Correra and the different museums in the Piazza di San Marco in Venice, it had to travel for a temporary exhibition. So for this temporary substitution, we created this facsimile that could be put in place 
for the duration of the exhibition. And then obviously using digital technologies for actual preservation of fragile objects or artworks that are about to deteriorate or about to disappear actually, it's one of the best reasons for making high resolution documentation. This is uh, one of the artworks by Banksy that appeared in the world in, in Venice in the, I think in the spring 2019. And we had the opportunity of uh, recording it, not only the color, but also the actual texture of the wall with photogrammetry. As you can see here, uh, my colleague from Factum shooting with his camera from a, from a water taxi, actually. And it was very important a kind of, as a kind of preservation exercise, because what happened is that a few months later, in the uh, November 2019, there was this uh, huge aqualta, this uh, flood, this phenomenon that was flooding all the center of Venice uh, with record levels, something that was not seen um, in many, many years, actually, since there are records of this type of flooding. So this um, uh, graffiti, this work of art, is not existing anymore as we could see it when we recorded it. So having these sections of Venice that are part of the history of Venice and having them documented and archived for the future is really the mission of our organization. So at the end, all these different approaches to how to use digital technologies and different fabrication techniques, we realized that it was necessary to find a way of applying them in order to record the whole city of Venice. The raising um, levels of water, it's obviously one of the issues in Venice. It's one of the uh, things that are part of the problems of the city, something that it's putting in danger, its uh, cultural heritage, their monuments, their works of art, and their history in general. So we decided to put in practice, just like a pilot project, documenting in 3D, in high resolution, the entire island of San Giorgio, where the facsimile of Veronese uh, was located 15 years ago, as a pilot project to see how could be done a recording of the full island of the full city of Venice. We started working with a combination of different systems, as we usually do, so combining photogrammetry with uh, 3D laser scanners like a LIDAR scanner that, as you know, it's mainly used for facades or architectural applications. But at the end, it's about how you combine the uh, close range recording technologies for the details of the texture and the long range 3D scanners for the actual shape and precise dimensions of buildings. We were working for two or three weeks in the summer of 2020, taking advantage of the fact that the island was actually empty because of COVID. So we could be recording not only the exterior spaces, but also the interiors of the different of the complex of San Giorgio. And in a work like this, the important thing is to be able to establish a hierarchy. It's not just about going and record everything in the highest resolution. You have to establish what are the important elements that can be recorded uh, just, let's say, in millimeter resolution, and then how can you combine that with recording specific sculptures or specific elements of the decoration that should be recorded in higher detail, in higher resolution. So we started with the Church of San Giorgio Maggiore by Palladio. We continued with probably the next important space, which is the staircase of Longena. Um, all these images that you can see are just previews of the 3D models that we are processing and we are generating. But the good thing is that even though it will take some time to process all this information, at least the original data, the raw information, it's already properly archived. So whatever it will happen to the island, at least we know we have a good documentation of how it was in 2020. Then we moved into the interior of the church, uh, documenting the chorus, documenting the altar, also looking at what elements should be recorded in high resolution or in medium or in low resolution. And then the interesting thing is what happened when we went down to the crypt under the church. 
it was possible to record in 3D the actual level of the water. It was uh, important because this is something that is not static. Obviously, it's a dynamic level. It's changing uh, with the tides. It's changing every season, every day, actually. So this idea of the relation between the island with the level of water and um, how can we record that digitally um, in a way gave us a reason or provided the, the justification for many of the things that we were doing. We have been looking at the texture of things. And when we were uh, finishing this recording and we were walking in the cloister, in the famous cloister of Palladio, we figured out that the walls, they were changing a lot from time to time. So the plaster walls, every time there was aqua alta, every, every season that there was flooding, it was making the walls to actually change its shape. This is just a comparison of the 3D information that we captured of the walls in two consecutive years. Uh, this is the way it looks, this uh, section uh, just this year in 2022. And it's just like, um, the symptom of what's happening with Venice, something that it is very easy to overlook, but it gives us you know, this um, reason for why it is important to look at the texture of things. So finally, uh, we decided to look at what are those main points of contact of the island with the surrounded water of the lagoon. And then working with Divirod, this uh, North American company, we have been installing three different uh, sensors that working through satellite uh, communication, they are capable of registering and anticipating the changes in the water level, raising in the tides and having this as part of a global network that uh, could provide new information about the movement of the water and about the effects of climate change. This is where we are now. We hope to apply these ideas and this approach to the whole city of Venice. And uh, I just wanted to share with you why we believe it's important to look at uh, cultural heritage preservation from different points of view, different scales, and especially from the texture of things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, and congratulations for your amazing work and thank you for sharing that with us. It's, it's amazing. Okay, uh, let's continue with our first project uh, for today, which is a project called Divinatory Interfaces from Green to Radio, and that was promoted by Juan Duarte and Bettina Cardialan. Uh, like the name of the project shows, uh, Juan and Bettina focus into wind and radio signals as energies that expand on a planetary scale. The project intention is to explore speculative computational representations uh, devising impossible links between airflow and radio transmission and observing their imperceptible but converging correlations. So Juan, Bettina, thank you so much and uh, whenever you want. Hello, everyone. Hey, hello. Can you hear us well? Yeah, now we hear you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah, Gr great to be here. Um, we start with introducing ourselves a little bit better and uh, then jumping into the subject, what we want to do. Um, my name is Bettina Katja Lange. I'm a German um, stage designer and visual media artist. So my background is theater, opera, performance, um, and I'm very much interested in a documentary core, like different kinds of storytelling, innovative uh, types of um, narrative threads. And uh, we show you some pictures from previous work. You see the latest work is VR, um, experience. It was opening at the CPH Docs and at the Goethe Institute in, in Beijing. And my name is Juan Carlos Dorte, um, Mexican. Um, I'm doing a, um, a PhD research in media arts in Alto University in Finland. And both of us, we are based in between Berlin and Zurich, Mexico City, Tallinn. And right now, at the moment, we are in Madrid, uh, since Bettina is working at the Opera in Teatro Real. And tonight we are having a premiere, so we are thrilled to share the night also here as well. And 
just uh, share some also some examples of my work in the media arts part and instrument making, performative, um, environmental sensing, environmental sound work. All right. So we want to start with an anecdote. Last week in Madrid, we witnessed an interesting phenomenon. One day, the sky was colored in red, and little by little, we noticed that the city was covered by a thin layer of dust. Later on, we learned from the news that the dust came from the Sahara Desert and reached out to many parts in Spain and other parts in Europe as well, including Denmark and Switzerland. You can see some pictures. And this phenomenon known as the Saharan air layer or haze carries particles of sand across the ocean. And depending on certain weather conditions, it crosses the Atlantic Ocean. Besides the reach of the sand particles, the Saharan air layer creates a perceivable effect on the color of the sky. Here is a picture on the left from Berlin and another in the northern part of Mexico during the haze time. The particles of sand dust end up reflecting sunlight as, the, as a side effect and cooling down this atmosphere. Divinator interfaces, our project looks into speculative computing representations, devising potential links between airflow and radio transmissions, and observing their correlations, which imperceptibly converge. So wind, an air movement triggered by different pressure, uh, by pressure differences. It's an ambivalent force. For thousands of years, wind has been in the mind of uh, the people, and until now, it's really hard to grab. Wind animates mankind to complex philosophical and religious considerations. Wind connects mankind with environment and the universe. It's feared, it's honored, it's quieted and evaluated, um, evaluated <laughs> to the status of God. Let's have a look on this. Okay, there, so there's Odin, Odin in the, the wind of the North Europe. And in Hebrew, they call him Ruach. 5,000 years ago, people prayed to Enlil, the oldest god still known until today. And the Greeks, for example, separated their gods into um, north, south, west, and eastern points, and into the seasons. Like, for example, Boras, the god of the winter north wind. And in Japan, the god called Fud, Funjin. And the word hurricane originally came from the Mayan god Huracan. So wind also presents, um, represents spirits. And it says in the Bible, when the wind comes into the house, it also fills up everybody with the Holy Spirit. The breath, our, our own personal um, breath connects the unconscious with the conscious. Whenever I live, it breathes and it breathes in me automatically. So we are connected in the breath with all other lives at the same time. And until today, um, we mystify it. We personify the wind and other nature phenomena far beyond its weather properties. And still the wind is our faithful mate. It's a transmitter of message. It's a friend or threatening enemy. Um, and in count uncountable poetry, lyrics and song texts, uh, it reminds us to, to look, look out for possible answers in the wind. For example, who has seen the wind, neither you nor I, but when the trees bow down their heads, the wind is passing by. So question, how can we plug into this communication channel? And how does, how, what does it report? Where is the interface between the two dynamics we favor so much, the wind and the radio? The Aeolian harp was an instrument invented by the German Jesuit Athanasius Kircher. It consisted of a device that played music depending on the wind currents. The Aeolian harp, was um, could give accounts of natural entities that communicated with humans in a specific landscapes. This message of the Eolian harp was not the kind of a weather forecast system, but it was an artifact for premonition and divination. More recent technologies for weather prediction include the use of anemometers in combination with thermometers and atmosphere pressure devices and chemical air compounds. The American naturalist Henry David Thoreau described a similar behavior between the ancient Aeolian harp and that from when the early telegraph lines produced when the air hanging cables were moved by the wind. 
On this, David Toro coined the term telegraphic harp. And this painting, The Song of the Talking Wires by Henry Farney, we can see a Native American man listening to that kind of sound described by Tono. There's a crossing between nature and technology in this shared landscape, where human transformations of nature produce new forms of divination. Mythologies on the atmospheric phenomena known as natural radio were assimilated to a channeling with non-human mediums until radio became a vernacular of media and a domesticated technology. When working on the development of wireless telegraphy, Thomas Watson, the assistant of Edison, listened to natural radio, thinking that this was a communication channel with other non-human entities. So what we want to try, um, our approach is to create a kind of weather stations. We are interested in creating different types and costume-made weather stations, which are placed in different parts of Madrid. And this gives us a basic setup and a prototype for sensing wind and radio data from a specific field. As you can see here in the picture, it's kind of a sketch for that. And on the other side, we are uh, prototyping these sort of um, custom-made uh, weather stations with circuits that we are developing ourselves and um, the, the electronics that go together. And this go with a system of low radio transmission. So it's sending from, for a long distance to, to the space in, for example, in Matadero. And then this compound of data, we are processing them. So we want to connect this data input finally with an instrument interface, which is part of a past and ongoing research from Juan. And um, we are looking for a kind of spatial distribution or haptical output, perhaps creating like sound visual visualizations through vibration, basically um, exploring energy transduction to turn sensor data into visible, audible and tactable media with a certain kind of narrative interpretation. We are very much interested in the focus of technologies beyond a deterministic and utilitarian human-centered purpose, implying a um, diversified, diversified perspective that includes indigenous, remote knowledge and a decolonization of technology, underlining non-human agencies and a sense of planetary endowment. Thanks a lot for your attention. And we would like to add that we would like to use this opportunity of the two-week workshop in Madrid to contact specialists in weather measurement prediction and people who are um, able to work with these uh, sort of technologies to, to place um, these weather stations and processing this data for prediction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Juan and Metina, for your presentation. It was great. Looking forward to see how the project goes during the workshop. OK, uh, for our next project, uh, we have uh, uh, two collectives, the collective La Colmena and uh, Amente Tabanoi. And in the presentation of them, uh, we have today Laura Reyes, Paula Castro, and Julian Santa that are presenting a project called Food Memories, uh, Connected Countryside City Territories. And how they define it is a digital application where the rural voices of the invisible work are recognized and the food memory of the territory is vindicated to a talking map, an implementation of an urban prototype, approaching the deep countryside to agriculture and interactive map like sensory stations. So Laura, Paula, Julian, thank you so much. And the floor is yours. Vale, gracias. Bueno, muy buen día para todos y todas. Eh, mucho gusto. Mi nombre es Julián Santa, compañera Paula, la compañera Lua. Eh, nuestra propuesta se llama Memorias Alimentarias Conectando a los Territorios Campo y Ciudad. Bueno, nosotros somos una juntanza de jóvenes de la ciudad de Bacatá, Colombia, con muchos sueños, utopías y unos sentires haceres alrededor de la memoria alimentaria, la biología, la arquitectura y prácticas organizativas en los territorios. Bueno, ¿qué venimos haciendo y caminando? Venimos caminando alrededor del rescate de la memoria ancestral de los alimentos, las semillas, los espacios de, de agricultura, manejo de residuos orgánicos a través de los compostajes y espacios comunitarios para el fortalecimiento de economías locales y de semillas. ¿Qué territorios hemos caminado? 
Consideramos que es necesario caminar el territorio pues, para reconocer esas memorias y esa pluralidad de voces invisibilizadas y silenciadas por las múltiples violencias que hemos sufrido y alrededor del derecho al alimento y a la tierra. Y en estas... Ah, ¿Quieres dar el... La siguiente, por favor. Bueno, ¿qué comunidades nos han acompañado en esta juntanza? Nos han encontrado comunidades afrocampesinas del territorio, comunidades indígenas de la comunidad Zenú, comunidad Kogi de la Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, neocampesinos, personas que se deciden ir a, a reencontrar su origen en el campo, en el Bonda, en Santa Marta. Eh, bueno, ¿y qué venimos? Hacemos porque estas caminadas pues de, reconocemos esa convicción del amor al territorio, donde las comunidades se organizan en el rescate de las semillas, la soberanía, la seguridad y la auto, autodeterminación alimentaria, prácticas bioculturales en la defensa de espacios de vida liderados por mujeres, hombres y niños. Eh, bueno, ¿qué, ¿qué se ha logrado? Eh, a partir de este caminar, eh, germinó eh, caminando la memoria alimentaria, eh, las voces detrás del trabajo invisible, eh, en donde hemos venido desarrollando eh, un mapa parlante tipo cartel, donde se han visibilizado todas esas experiencias, todos esos sueños, esas luchas por ser territorios rurales, libres y dignos. Entonces, digamos que acá, eh, a raíz de esos vínculos, eh, se, han podido, se han podido generar eh, jornadas de siembra, talleres, todo en torno como al alimento, a, al cuidado del medio ambiente. Y eh, ya estando acá en Bogotá, pues ese intercambio generó también como esa posibilidad de eh, hacer la Casa de Semillas, eh, la Casa de Semillas Sulajuy acá en, en Bogotá. Eh, bueno. Eh, bueno, sobre nuestro proyecto. Eh, en primera instancia, eh, lo que queremos empezar a trabajar es una aplicación web o una website eh, donde toda esa información que se recogió, todas esas voces, todas esas historias, todas esas imágenes, eh, se puedan organizar en, en esa aplicación y digamos que cualquier persona en el lugar en el que esté pueda tener acceso a la información que, que estamos compartiendo. Esta aplicación web la organizamos, eh, digamos que durante el viaje hubo unas preguntas eh, que rigieron pues, el, el viaje, que tenían pues, eh, mucha relación con la memoria alimentaria, entonces dentro de esas preguntas y temas eh, trabajamos pues, qué es la memoria alimentaria, eh, sobre los procesos de recuperación de tierras, eh, sobre las casas de semillas comunitarias, sobre las mujeres rurales, sobre las plantas nativas eh, o alimentos nativos, sobre semillas también y sobre plantas medicinales. Eh, bueno, ya como eh, en la parte, digamos, del prototipo urbano y el mapa interactivo, eh, nosotros pensamos que Bogotá es un sitio donde confluyen muchas culturas muy diversas y digamos que siempre hay un intercambio de todas esas culturas y nos parece muy importante que todos esos procesos se puedan fortalecer eh, y que esos intercambios pues, se sigan fortaleciendo. Entonces es por eso que queremos implementar eh, talleres vivos eh, donde se trabaje la memoria y se reflexione en torno al alimento. Eh, también por medio de un mapa interactivo eh, urbano conectado a distintas eh, estaciones sensoriales, eh, donde a través de los sentidos eh, podamos viajar y recordar nuestros orígenes, eh, de dónde venimos y esa riqueza también como del, del alimento eh, dentro del territorio. Eh, es por eso que mm, pensamos en la agricultura urbana como ese escenario educativo y conector del campo y la ciudad, como a, a través de esta, estos conocimientos y toda esta inspiración podemos generar espacios más conscientes, como a través de las huertas comunitarias y el diseño participativo, pues podemos tener esas herramientas para generar un sentido de apropiación por el espacio público y por el derecho también a la ciudad y al alimento. Eh, bueno, 
Nosotros también tuvimos la oportunidad de hacer un análisis ya de campo real después del viaje. Entonces analizamos un sector de Bogotá que está ubicado en el sur de la ciudad, eh, alrededor de la cuenca del río Fucha. Entonces elegimos este lugar porque en, aquí convergen muchos actores socioambientales que pues velan por el, la recuperación de esta memoria ancestral y como el reconocimiento del río como espacio de vida. Actualmente el uso de este espacio pues es baldío, eh, está un poco abandonado y también no se le da el uso adecuado. Entonces nosotros nos imaginamos cómo este prototipo urbano podría eh, relacionarse con el territorio por medio de, por medio de elementos como el compostaje urbano, que son las pacas digestoras que eh, reci, eh, compostan residuos a escala urbana, mobiliario público, huertas, la arborización nativa, senderos eh, y una señalización eh, que permita unir estas estaciones sensoriales. Bueno, ya en cuanto a la estación sensorial que viene siendo como el, el que va a conectar la aplicación web con el prototipo urbano por medio de estas estaciones. Eh, ya en el caso puntual del Caribe, le pusimos Caribe Profundo, la estación del Caribe Profundo, donde también queremos como recrear los espacios que visitamos, que pues ellos, las comunidades rurales indígenas y campesinas eh, manejan las casas de pensamiento. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos trasladar y esto y pues poderlo mostrar en, en la ciudad? donde sea un espacio simbólico que busque a través de los sentidos evocar los paisajes, representar la cultura y permitir a los distintos territorios hablar, hablar y generar los intercambios del campo y la ciudad. Entonces, por medio de los, los cinco sentidos eh, más básicos que conocemos, como son la vista, a través de las luces que nos evoquen a estos paisajes, eh, a través del olfato, también, digamos, en cuanto a los alimentos, la agricultura urbana, las semillas... Eh, también el sentido del tacto, lo quisimos representar con la variedad de tejidos y de técnicas ancestrales que aún viven en nuestros territorios rurales, en donde muestran toda la ancestralidad y toda la cosmogonía de los pueblos. Eh, también en medio del gusto, pues ahí ya también entran los alimentos, las semillas y la parte del, del, del oído, de la escucha, queremos también poder representar estas voces o estos paisajes sonoros en esta estación sensorial. Entonces, básicamente, el perfil de colaboradores que estamos buscando para este laboratorio vivo son como artistas de todo tipo, arquitectos, eh, bioconstructo bioconstructores, diseñadores de, de instalaciones, también diseñadores gráficos, industriales, eh, textiles biólogos, ambientalistas, eh, agricultores urbanos. También hay las, nos, nos interesa conocer los procesos de casas de semillas eh, para vincularlos con la ciudad de Madrid, eh, como estos procesos de agroecología, permacultura que hay en la ciudad. Y pues ya en cuanto a conocimientos de tipo tecnológico que desarrollen herramientas digitales como tipo aplicación, ingenieros de luz y sonido, vendría siendo como el... Eh, nuestros perfiles de colaboradores. Bueno, nosotros pues eh, a partir de este proceso colaborativo, eh, la pregunta pues orientadora del, del Media Lab es ¿puede la ciudad pensar? Y nosotros pues pensamos cómo el territorio tiene memoria, entonces nos dimos cuenta que a través de este proyecto eh, el territorio efectivamente tiene una memoria colectiva muy importante como un tejido que se ha venido construyendo pues mediante todas estas comunidades que han pasado a través de él y todo este tejido es uno solo, ¿sí? no es como separar el territorio de la ciudad y el campo, sino reconectarlo nuevamente a través de recordar por medio de los espacios y la exploración de los sentidos eh, como todas estas tecnologías ancestrales y estos conocimientos propios de nuestro territorio. Eh, y pues por último una frase que nos parece muy linda de una autora, Silvia Rivera, que dice, mirando atrás y adelante podemos caminar 
en el presente futuro. Y este es nuestro proyecto. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Uh, well, to continue, we, we move on with our next guest speaker, uh, which is also uh, the second uh, art Uh, like uh, artistic resident that we're going to have here in, in Middle Lab in the next few weeks. His name is uh, Gary Zekti-san. Uh, Gary is a visual artist and writer whose work explores uh, social infrastructures, technical histories, and conceptual systems. He was born in China, uh, grew up in Birmingham, and currently is based in London. He has studied at Glasgow School of Art, uh, Cambridge University, and the MIT. Uh, his practice works with film, installation, and uh, software. As a writer, uh, Sang is a regular contributor to Frizz and Elephant magazines and has also published in Phone, Firefly, and King's Review. As like we said, uh, Gary will be doing an artistic residency in Madrid in a collaboration between Media Lab and Art Catalyst in the next few, few weeks. And as part of his residency, Gary will be carrying out a workshop here in Media Lab. So stay tuned because we will give more info about this very, very soon. So Gary, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, all yours. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so for the residency at uh, Media Lab Matadero, I'll be um, essentially expanding on a project which I've been engaged in for the last almost two years now, which is No Sleeping Called FUD. Um, and in this talk, I'll just kind of go through some of the works that have been part of that project or the, the strands of research and also the kinds of uh, questions I'm involved in it, which I'm hoping to bring also to the residency. So um, my work in the last few years, I guess, has, has changed a little bit in, in the sense that it has become uh, a little bit more kind of journalistic. It's been kind of guided by different sorts of encounters uh, with um, uh, people who work in various different industries. And this kind of all started when I began a project which was fundamentally concerned with ideas of prediction forecasting and what happens when you can't really use uh, the past to anticipate the future or when that, that type of feedback loop begins to fail uh, in your decision-making processes. So uh, a lot of this is focused especially around finance and insurance and partly in relation to what I've come to think of as a kind of temporal infrastructure, you know, since the 17th or 18th centuries, um, finance and insurance um, really emerge out of uh, a kind of mathematization of gambling and death um, into uh, create, you know, structures of probability of a law of large numbers of statistical techniques and those have been kind of fundamental parts of um, essentially the modern period since the, uh, since the Enlightenment. Uh, and at the heart of that is something to do with the idea of controlling time, using um, insurance to, to control against the prevalence of fire and catastrophe, for example, or uh, lotteries and gambling were also like the, the kind of playful end and the deadly end and the very technocratic end are all kind of very combined together in here within a kind of um, technical and, and moral system. And that's kind of something I'm quite interested in. And to bring it to a more kind of... Uh, practical side, I guess. Um, uh, a lot of this also relates to a relationship to nature or to uh, an idea of the Anthropocene in which the sort of figure and ground of the kind of subject and environment, the species and the world is starting to really mix together. And it's, uh, it, it's bec uh, becoming difficult to find the boundaries between um, uh, the various components in this kind of control system. So I'll just dive into a few different uh, aspects I've been looking at. Um, so the first one is the kind of starting points I had initially, which I just happened to meet someone who was working in the catastrophe insurance industry as a sim simulation model. So this is in a sense uh, how um, began one of the main questions that I've been looking at since is, which is how does nature enter the market or rather how does the kind of system of uh, infrastructure of kind of social coordination we have for better or worse known largely as market capitalism liberal some kind of liberal formation of capitalism um that kind of signaling transmission system how does that encounter the outside of its uh, of that which it's attempting to control and to to regulate so an example of this I, th I think a really kind of nice epitome of this happened in the early 90s um 
in the context of catastrophe insurance. So basically, uh, this is hurricanes, earthquakes, and kind of really huge devastating events. But between the 60s and the 90s, there was a relatively little um, large scale hurricane activity happening across um, the North American uh, region, which is where much of the market is located. And so um, essentially they were using statistical techniques to calculate, you know, second average of what the losses were in the last 10 or 20 years and just go on that. So they didn't really account for how um, the wind worked, how the sea temperature worked, how the kind of whole hydrological meteorological system was would guide these catastrophes and also the way in which catastrophes are man-made insofar they are a combination of the you know built environment of uh, social um, patterns in terms of let's say movement towards cities, concentration of um, risk. Uh, and so there's an interesting episode in the late 80s, early 90s, where this person called Karen Clark decided to, to um, uh, bring uh, computer models into the catastrophe calculation. So she basically created this flowchart, which is like a, a, a really seminal paper in this field, um, which was to say, because extremely, un well, extremely unlikely extreme uh, weather events are very rare by nature, it's very difficult to find um, a meaningful sample size of them to actually take uh, to, to find patterns. And so what her solution was to essentially do something called like a Monte Carlo uh, perturbation, which is basically to create plausible, use the, the historical data set to create fictional hurricanes, to create fictional storms. These are like plausible storms that can could easily have happened, but they, they match in many ways the patterns that already exist, but they create a larger sample size of fictional hurricanes. And she basically created a system in which you bring those into a relationship, these like fictional hurricane paths, and you bring those into relationship with um, everything from building codes to um, economic data and, all, and the like, and use that to calculate uh, the likelihood of a catastrophic loss. And she took that to the ins insurance industry and they said, doesn't really, we don't really need it. You know, we've been fine. And then Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992 and it wiped out half of the industry. And suddenly they realized, you know, there's a moment where the kind of financial industry realized that we actually need to account for nature. We need to account for um, this kind of infrastructure for mitigating disaster needs to actually understand the world that exists in. And that's when things get kind of complicated. Um, so this is a diagram I made a while ago of uh, how roughly the uh, catastrophe insurance infrastructure works these days. So basically in order to, you know, this is also about how uh, a kind of relationship to nature is tied up with the kind of relations within the capital markets. So this is a diagram showing how um, after Hurricane Andrew, after uh, the late 90s uh, disaster for the industry, they realized basically that we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money to even cover another big disaster like this. And we don't know anything about how they're going to happen. So like we have two problems. We can't, we can't actually predict um, meaningful patterns about the future of hurricanes. And also we don't have enough money to cover the insurance if there was a devastating hit on let's say Miami or something. And so, um, eventually, they did realize they had to access the pools of <clears throat> the pools of capital within the global uh, um, securities markets. Basically, the biggest pools of capital in the world. This money is made out of other forms of uh, anticipation and prediction on future events. For example, a lot of it, I think, forty percent or something, is made out of pension funds, which is just like individual workers' kind of um, investments in their kind of post-retirement life and so on. And a lot of it is also tied up, of course, in property, which is the fundamentally the land and property, which itself is changing within the kind of uh, climate crisis, is also what is fundamentally the source of both the, the value of capital and the value of uh, the, the, the risks that are being traded within this um, insurance context. So just to take you through this kind of little diagram super quickly, you can see how you know, there's a kind of rough reduction of the world in the top left. Uh, they take the, they insure them, uh, they, get, they get insured on insurers who actually uh, have their own form of insurance called reinsurance, which are these huge um, companies mostly based in Western Europe. And those reinsurers, in order to access the securities market, uh, take their 
boxes of risk, boxes of insurance contracts and package them up. Not that dissimilarly from what happened in the subprime mortgage crisis in the uh, mortgage-backed securities back in 2007 and 8. And they take them to Bermuda, which is a great place to, if you want to make a kind of shell company or you want to make a special company that basically only packages various kinds of contracts into something that resembles a security that can be sold on the wider financial markets. So they take that to, uh, to Bermuda, turn all these different people's risks into a single securities package, and then take that and sell that to institutional investors, such as again, such as pension funds who are investing in these things themselves, at a very high risk, high return uh, form of investments. They're basically like middle class bonds. You know, they're, they're in an environment where you can barely get um, positive bond yields these days. It's extremely attractive for, let's say, a hedge fund manager to say, okay, I can take a big risk, but I'll get a 15% return on my uh, my investments. And what this investment is, is essentially you're renting a hurricane. You're renting a period of time in which a hurricane may or may not happen. So if you look at the bottom of the diagram, like you, um, the company will, the, the investor will put up, let's say 500 million or something. And then if the hurricane occurs and it hits a certain threshold, then they lose that money. If it doesn't occur, they, uh, um, get like 15% on their money or something. So it's this kind of uh, this curious um, situation, had, which has risen out not only for hurricanes, but also for everything from civil unrest to riots to other eventualities in the world, which is fundamentally not that different from a form of sports gambling or sports betting. You're essentially betting on um, a, a particular eventuality in the future. And you know, also not that dissimilar to prediction markets for those of you familiar with that. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of financialization of the future, which has been ongoing as a process since, uh, in lots of ways, since at least the 1970s in, in kind of the global economy. But this is kind of a stage in which, okay, how do you actually take account of the kind of chaotic nature of natural uncertainties into the financial system? So to briefly zoom through, um, we made, Agnes Cameron and I, uh, collaborate and I, we made a simulation of the catastrophe insurance market using the same data sets that they use. It's a data set called HERDATS2, which is essentially 150 years of American hurricanes. Um, and we cr created a, a simulation, which I think there should be a video here, which is basically generating fictional hurricanes live all the time. You can go to the website. Um, and at the same time, upon this um, generated, uh, this kind of uh, 10,000 year model, so-called not because it predicts in 1,000 years, because it predicts 10,000 versions of next year. So uh, these modelers are basically saying, we'll take next year's hurricanes or what we think might happen and run that 10,000 times so we can take an average. And that average will tell you, you've got a 2% chance of losing your money or something like that. And so in, the, in our simulation, uh, what's going on is you've got all of these You've got a simulation of the hurricanes in the first place, but on top of that, you've got a simulation of a marketplace. So it's um, uh, you've got all of these different um, actors, like bots, basically, who are playing uh, on a hurricane market, and they're placing bids according to whether or not the hurricane is leaning closer to land or away from it, and according to the kinds of risks that are being risked. And you know, at the heart of the, this whole ecosystem is is this this making of risk as a substance. You know, risk is not just something a chance that you might lose something; it's also a chance you might gain something. And in the context of insurance, for example, it's also similarly again to the two thousand and eight crisis. It's also something you have to create. You have to mine risk out of the future, and but you mine it by, for example, selling insurance contracts to people who can't afford them, or finding more like you know, there's a uh, finding more consumer populations to it to ensure. Um, I think there's a uh, there's a there's a phrase called insure to securitize. It's like you're you're insuring uh, or you're creating an insurance contract in order to be able to not to uh, be the first order insurer, and but in order to uh, make money off the securitization securitization of those insurance uh, contracts onto the wider market. Um, so. And another aspect, a kind of more philosophical, historical aspect to the work I've been doing has to do with the kind of history of catastrophe and natural disaster in particular. And I, for a while, was looking at two which are very, very impactful on the kind of uh, the course of civil, particular civilizations or particular cultures. So these were neatly in 1855 and 1755. 1855 was the Edo or modern day Tokyo earthquake. And what happened after this, which is quite interesting, and as far as I can tell, pretty unusual, 
especially in the kind of crisis capitalism sort of mode that we we're familiar with today, the kind of shock doctrine idea, um, is that uh, after a huge earthquake, one of three hit Edo in 1855, all of these incredible prints uh, in the popular press, anonymous prints came out. And what they represent is uh, people feeding this god called Namazu, uh, Namazu, which is like a catfish god. It's one of those kind of big, dumb animal deities. And this catfish, this giant catfish was supposed to live under the island of Japan. And every time it became um, disturbed or it became, it decides to move about, it would cause an earthquake. But what these prints actually show is the, the idea that, um, which is called something like world rectification, like uh, Yana Ashi, uh, Yona Ashi, um, which they show the, the people praying to the catfish, feeding the catfish, and the catfish not bring, bringing pain and suffering necessarily, although of course it did, uh, but actually restructuring society by releasing, by breaking down the land and the houses of the wealthy, and by uh, letting money flow through uh, the rest of society because woodworkers and sex workers and all sorts could suddenly come into um, this, the ruined city, the reconstructing city and charge five or six times their usual rates. And so this, this kind of marriage of uh, a kind of market economic ideal, the kind of moral good of the flow of money, and also the kind of uh, social restructuring from outside of the kind of redistribution of, of society through uh, this deity, which is also a natural force. Um, another which uh, you guys might be more familiar with is the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, which also had this kind of extraordinary effect on, you know, in some ways changing the discourse of the Enlightenment in terms of its relation to kind of free will and God, because how could the center of religious empire suddenly suffer the most kind of devastating uh, <clears throat> devastating earthquake and fire imaginable. I think it's still one of the biggest earthquakes ever to have hit Europe. Um, and what was interesting after this as well is that, um, you know, the king, I think, never was got so scared of earthquakes that he never slept under a roof again. And um, the uh, dictator or the, the kind of bureaucrat who became a kind of dictator, Pombal, who took over, uh, really took it upon this moment to, again, reshape society through uh, by means of the catastrophe. And this case is also similar to the Japan case is also a kind of modernization, secularization kind of narrative uh, in relation to uh, economics, because what he basically did was, um, I mean, he burned one of the great Jesuits, uh, Joseph Malagrida at the stake and one of the last auto de fe's. Uh, he didn't really rebuild most of the religious buildings in the city. And instead, the new city plan was uh, built around the commercial plaza. It's also, it happens to be one of the first um, grid plans in, uh, um, uh, Europe, I think, one of the first kind of modern grid urban plans. So these are just a few images of an exhibition I did last year, which uh, relates to some of these themes. Uh, here's a little monument to the catfish with uh, some coinage, and here are a couple of uh, nails. I became quite obsessed with artifacts during this time, and there's a couple of nails which are supposedly have survived the Lisbon earthquake but from an excavation uh, of a building. Um, from uh, which had been standing before 1755. Um, another strand that I'll quickly run through, which is also a related theme. And again, this is, came out of a kind of chance encounter. Uh, when I lived in New York, um, I uh, got to meet this financial astrologer uh, for whom financial astrologers are actually not super uncommon. It's maybe if you think about people who, you know, an astrologer who reads, uh, reads the future via the stars, and a financier who is like under a huge amount of pressure, basically to tr also trying to read the future through the incredible ocean of noise of financial patterns. Uh, the one thing, you know, one thing everyone knows is you can't beat the market, but everyone's job is to beat the market. Um, so financial, but they have a really interesting toolkit. So what you see here is Henry Weingarten's um, uh, book. Uh, this is the astrologer that I was hoping to make a film with. Was, I can show a bit of a trailer. Um, and uh, these are the tools he uses. So this is the incorporation chart of IBM, and this is the first trading chart of IBM. This is like a horoscope for corporations. And by using that, he, he thinks of it as having an edge on the market, as a kind of using like a fourth public data point that isn't really used. And what's kind of interesting in relation to using the cosmic data of you know, astrology in, to try to predict the market is that a, there's a very different temporality in not in in finance, there's um, you know the stock markets and so on. It's you've got this fundamental unpredictability, um, 
and you've got this kind of uh, a total blindness to the future and a kind of wealth of um you know patterning and data coming from the past whereas in astrology in a sense you don't really have um a distinctive temporality in a normal kind of past and future sense because you know if you look at almanacs whether it's an astrologer's almanac or a, or an uh uh, an ephemera database from NASA, you basically know the exact position of everything going, you know, 5,000 years in the past and 5,000 years in the future. And the only reason you don't know is because orbits are calculated to something like six or seven decimals. So you have this, like, everything is, in a sense, perfectly fixed and predictable, I, you know, the, the, the solar system. Uh, but what they do have is this um, incredible way of reading the stars in order to, to, um, use it within financial patterns. I'm fairly agnostic as to the actual effectiveness of this, but Henry does pretty well financially. The other astrologers I meet seem to do pretty well with their clients. And I think it's more of a kind of uh, interesting interrelationship of these two epistemes, these two ways of um, uh, ways of practicing in an uncertain world and how they kind of form tools to, to, to make kind of claims upon the future. Uh, in, in a way which you can almost think of them as like two parts of the same fiction. Um, this, sure, let's see. I'm sure the rocks are not worried. I don't know if I have so much time, so I'm not going to go through the... The advantage of astrology is it's not built into the marketplace. It's basically behavioral economics. It's been done for 5,000 years. We always like to say that of the four things in the marketplace, we can just watch a minute. which are the fundamentals and technicals, inside knowledge and astrology. Astrology is the second best forecaster. Uh, inside knowledge is the best, but it's not legal. So astrology is a little bit like a, a form of inside knowledge. Yes, except it's perfectly legal. So um, after meeting Henry, I met another economist who was uh, working at a Washington-based large economic institution but also, also um, was wanted to speak about something which is, uh, also seemed kind of unusual at first, which was the idea that the sun has uh, a deep effect on both financial crises and social revolutions. And what he was doing actually was to uh, extend the work of two very quite interesting and influential practitioners, like uh, one of the founding members of um, uh, the marginalist revolution in economics in the late 19th century, who essentially one of the sort of precursor founder, founding fathers of neoclassical economics, uh, as well as this uh, cosmist scientist called uh, Alexander Zhezhevsky. And both of them uh, were obsessed with this idea that the magnetic forces on the surface of the sun, this other kind of force from outside, uh, had a profound effect on human behavior and on the activity of financial markets. And it's obviously in some ways relating to the, uh, the kind of relative unpredictability or seemingly kind of uh, emergent qualities of both of those uh, types of systems. Um, but what's kind of fascinating here is that, uh, so this is Mikhail and his work is basically about um, how uh, understanding the correlation between social movements, social revolutions and solar cycles, which are basically the cycles of fluctuations of uh, magnetic activity on the surface of uh, the sun. Um, this, again, it seems kind of unusual, but uh, this, I, after a bit of research, I guess I realized that this is actually something that's been haunting economics from um, in the, the beginning of, uh, well, this kind of modern periods, in a way, because uh, Alexander, uh, no, uh, William Jevons, the marginalist uh, in the 19th century, one of his like great obsessions was also how how to predict economic crises and how he eventually spent years trying to understand what was the relationship between the activity of the sun and the activity of markets. And he kind of obsessed over it. And it, everyone laughed at him about it and he couldn't prove it. Uh, but he was obsessed with, uh, with the idea that there was something there. Um, and so it's uh, I uh, made a, a an interview with Mikhail uh, where he was really um, explaining his uh, extension of these theories and how he couldn't prove it. Of course, no one can. But as an economist, as someone who thinks in terms of data and statistics, he also couldn't really peel himself away from the idea that there was a correlation. And he, since there was a more than um, insignificant correlation, he also couldn't deny it. So um, I think I'll skip over this interview. Uh, so um, this kind of 
current stage of my work, um, after kind of thinking and working a lot with these different um, players and uh, like uh, professionals within uh, this kind of world of thinking about speculation, about calculation of time, about kind of constructing constraints on the kind of movement of different um, you know, financial winds, if you like. Um, I've also kind of uh, more lately become interested in like the, the idea of speculation as a constructive force, which is something we think about a lot in art and design these days, but I don't really mean just kind of imagining otherwise or imagining a possible scenario, but also more specifically thinking about like, okay, what actually creates speculation uh, within this powerfully financialized capitalism we currently live in? Because, you know, every everyone, speculation goes both ways. Like in, a, in, in insofar as, uh, you know, for example, especially the technology world that we're kind of all, uh, talking about a little bit is powerfully um, driven by uh, kind of investor capitalism and especially VCs and also the way in which you know the stock market is not a, a recording of current kind of economic performance it's a recording of anticipations of future growth and it's uh, it's price of determination of the kind of collective expectation upon a, a future trajectory of time and so what this requires is a kind of larger and larger incorporation of speculators of kind of individuals as well as states as speculators within this wider, wider economy as well as the, the subjects of speculation so for example the way in which government policies <clears throat> as much as they are determined in some ways by democratic processes are heavily beholden to bond markets bond markets themselves uh, which are essentially part of the wider financial markets which are also you know in, intertwined with pension funds with insurance with all these different things um, so I'm kind of at the moment really interested in exploring um, questions around this kind of idea of a infrastructure and a supply chain of speculation. Like where where does uh, if if everyone is kind of incorporated, and you see occasional flashes of this, especially more recently. I mean, obviously with cryptocurrencies and the kind of crazy speculative fever around them, uh, but also with uh, things like GameStop, the the kind of uh, uprising of uh, Wall Street bets uh, early last year. And so um, I'll not talk too much through this project, um, but this this was um, uh, a project I did around uh, this uh, country called Poye in the early 19th century, just around the same time in, this was happening in what is now Northern Honduras, around the same time that uh, Bolivar was leading the kind of independence movements of countries like Peru and Venezuela, or what later became. <clears throat> um, there was this guy called Gregor McGregor, who was basically a mercenary, uh, an English, a Scottish soldier. And he'd fought with Bolivar and, you know, various escapades around um, Central and South America. At one point, I think he founded a new nation in the Republic of Florida, which lasted for about two weeks. Uh, but it was this in this kind of like um, revolutionary and sort of nation building uh, fervor. And at one point, he got hold of a piece of land in Northern Honduras with the permission of the kind of indigenous king there. And he decided to set up a country. And what he did was to kind of really go full hog into imagining uh, uh, how a country might function, invented a civil service, invented an encyclopedia of all of its plants and animals, uh, invented a currency, and then took that to um, England where people, the, the London Stock Exchange had just really been going for a few decades. And this was just before one of the first great commercial crises uh, of the modern period uh, in 1825. And he took that and uh, he basically sold this fictional country, which was just him and a pile of rocks, to the London Stock Exchange at the same time as people were furiously buying resources, debts in uh, the newly formed South American independent states. And so this is kind of an interesting era because uh, this, and it builds upon how the kind of this, the forces of speculation fundamentally, fundamentally begins to destabilize both the meaning of money and the meaning of uh, kind of these larger conceptual and legal fictions such as um, such as the states. And so in a way, McGregor was able to kind of slip in on this wave of speculation and then hundreds of people invested, well, thousands of people invested in his country and like gave him, he made scammed huge millions and millions of pounds over this. But not only that, hundreds of people went to colonize it. You know, he played upon the, the this kind of era of peak colonial um, further within the, the center of the British empire and convinced hundreds of people to trade their pounds for Poye dollars, uh, which uh, look like this. Um, and 
travel for like 60 days or something to this uh, piece of rock in um, a kind of very barren part of what's now Honduras. And most of them died of fever. Um, all of them, actually, I think some got some escapes to Jamaica, but basically hundreds of people uh, would be colonizers end up dying on his rock. And what's interesting about the end of the story is that um, after he got found out as a scammer, not only did his uh, country's investments, those stocks continue to trade, even though he had fled, he continued to trade for decades. Uh, but at the same time, he fled, fled away as this kind of pariah and then uh, fled to Venezuela, where he was welcomed as a war hero because he had actually helped to turn that state, that place from a, a fiction of a kind of uh, uh, revolutionary population into a reality of this persistent legal fiction of the nation state. So he was welcomed back and given like a hero's pension and lived the rest of his life like that. So it's... um. I, through this story, I guess uh, I, I've been kind of trying to think about uh, what I've also been calling uh, temporal engineering. You know, what are what are the it, within this kind of highly financialized and highly speculative set of dynamics that you know characterize certainly a lot of the kind of cultural and technological landscape, and arguably is fundamental to the kind of line between art and finance as well. Um, what are what are the mechanisms that you can build? What are the kind of ways you can conceive of uh, intervening or of you know really reshaping the dynamics of this uh, system of which is based on you know principles of things like privatized reward and socialized risk like how can whether it's a state or populations and communities to turn that into something more like a socialized risk socialized reward system where there's uh, you you are really kind of going back to the earlier iterations of the, the ideal of insurance which is a, a possibility of um, collectively mitigating, forming, uh, creating forms of resilience, and also, in a sense, controlling time, at least creating a kind of temporal infrastructure between each other, which is kind of self-sustaining. Um, so to this end, uh, I've been kind of mapping out some of the, the different strands that um, I've been looking at at the moment and hope to bring this to a workshop at Media Lab. Um, and so in a kind of rough rundown of what I'll be doing at the Matadero residency at Media Lab, uh, there'll be a, a public workshop which will be announced soon, which will be mostly, I think, uh, focused around uh, climate finance and thinking about different, again, like forms of uh, levels of intervention, levels of, of action within the kind of, um, let's say the temporal infrastructure, the kind of scenario uh, planning world of um, climate mitigation. Um, at different kinds of scales. And I mean, I've actually never been to Spain before, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of mostly also just looking forward to coming, kind of presenting some ideas and to meet other practitioners, organizations, especially at this kind of intersection of the social, ecological, and also financial infrastructures. So uh, as an example of that, I'm, I'm uh, hoping to, to kind of engage with various practitioners within working within kind of new cooperative structures. I'm also very interested in uh, Mondragon Corporation, uh, the kind of uh, really exciting like digital civics kind of work that seems, has been happening in Spain, especially in Barcelona, and as well as kind of different kind of emerging corporate forms that are happening, I guess, more within the kind of crypto DAO space, but also within different forms of collective uh, production. Uh, in another side of my work, I'm very interested in food systems, in, especially in collaboration with uh, Agnes Cameron, as well as in rewilding and land regeneration projects uh, partly because what they've done it within this kind of current uh, concept context of the Anthropocene is to kind of uh, really bring about uh, uh, a totally destabilized set of coordinates around uh, the valuation of nature, the idea of you know, what, is, uh, what, what is natural and what is kind of part of the value system that humanity can afford and also is trying to control. Uh, there's various kind of crazy things going on in terms of uh, the actual kind of um, tokenization and securitization of natural assets, um, ecosystem services, all this stuff. Uh, that's kind of all in the world of what I'm uh, currently thinking a lot about. And I hope to, um, yeah, I hope to find people uh, at Media Lab who would also be interested in, in uh, working on stuff like that together. There's also um, for the Open Lab, I'll be doing a performance. Well, not me personally, but I've been working uh, with Waste Paper Opera. Together, we are working on um, an oratorio called Dead Cat Bounce, which is also circulating many of these ideas. And we'll be bringing a version of that performance to Open Lab on May 6th. 
uh, and also currently um, editing a, a book called Catastrophe Time, which is again within this universe, which I'll be kind of working on during that period as well. Uh, that's all, thank you. Oh yeah, this, this is a nice quote from Elena Esposito. Um, uh, what is sold in the financial markets is the possibility of the creation of constraints over the course of time. Thank you so much for that, Gary. <clears throat> Actually, it was amazing. So, such an interesting and complex, complex intertwined collection of concepts. Uh, a lot to unfold there, yeah. Uh, looking forward to welcoming you in Madrid in, and hopefully have some time to discuss some of that in, in future conversations. So thank you so much. Um, OK, so let's move on to the next project, uh, uh, which is called Earth Interface Prototype, a microphone for the planet by Carlos Porpa. Carlos, sadly, uh, he couldn't join us today uh, on live, but uh, he recorded a video that we're going to uh, showcase now. Um, just to give you some context, uh, the project it starts from the premise that the Earth is a living being and aims to obtain an artistic record of this animated entity. Also, I'll have to discuss in that sentence. Uh, but continuing with the with this author's uh, research of the figure of that the art is machine and delving into the possibilities offered by land art to produce a dialogue between the natural and artificial. These are uh, Carlos' words. So let's uh, move on with the video. Um, and yeah. Hello, friends, and welcome to the presentation of my project, Earth Interface. Earth Interface is basically a microphone for the planet. And the origin of the idea was um, an artistic residence that I had a an um, old boat uh, owned by La Fura dels Baus, uh, in which I have um, a stage of about eight months uh, performing with the robot musicians uh, band that I made. And during those days, uh, especially during the whales, uh, the raging of the wind in the ropes of the boat um, makes me somehow uh, thinking in the idea of that boat becoming like a huge microphone for the planet. So the idea of the microphone for the planet uh, come with me and I try to represent it with this piece, which is um, an installation by day and a performing piece by night. And it's made around a 20 foot container, which is this part in here. And let me see, I like this much better. And there's a structure uh, made out of uh, steel or aluminum, in, which holds uh, an Aeolian arp, which goes 12 meters and supports uh, an structure for the rest of the sound inputs that mm, the piece have coming from different aspects of the planet, like the sun, like the earth, like the wind, like the bodies of water. Uh, we go in, in more detail with that later. So uh, by the day, it, it acts like a workshop uh, and by the night, this part moves like that and becomes a projection screen. So the whole piece become, becomes a, a stage for performing arts. Uh, of course, related with the, the idea of the, the planet as an artist and somehow uh, inviting from, for jam sessions with the planet and uh, human artist. So uh, this is more or less the way of functioning. Um, and now I'm going to explain you what I want from this workshop of Matadero. I don't know if it's visible, I think so. Okay, uh, we are gonna make three different workshops for preparing all the parts for the piece. Um, one is the 
the computer, the informatical architecture, gabinet, uh, and then I need to determine how big the computer need to be, uh, which sound card do we need to move around all the um, all the bits of sound that the robotic DJ uh, will mix later on. Uh, also, uh, we need to actually build that robot DJ. I think uh, pure data patch will make it, or maybe we can use Max. Uh, those are things to be determined by the technicians. Then there's another workshop, which is the electronics uh, workshop to make uh, the different um, analogic devices for interacting with the, with the planet. Uh, some of them are the pickups for the, for the strings for the Olean Arp, which is like basically a, a giant electric guitar. Um, the solar engines, which are uh, basically a solenoid hooked to a capacitor, which is fed by uh, a, a solar panel. So when the capacitor is full, uh, releases the energy through the solenoid, and then we have a mechanical reaction to, to heat a percussion or maybe heat another kind of um, musical instrument, we'll see. Uh, also, we need to build the earth resonator, which is basically a huge piece of uh, metal um, grounded and buried in the ground and with a string to pick up the sounds of the, of the sub subsoil. Also, uh, we are going to play with uh, some toys, uh, analogic toys, uh, like those ones in here for circuit bending. And well, this is more or less <clears throat> the set of uh, analogic uh, noises that I use it with the, um, with the robots, with the musical robot band. Um, there are some few speak and spill, which is the first uh, analogic um, voice synthesizer mass produced in the 80s and it's a very cool tool for for bending and for getting very surprising results there are also a collection of a small um, brain devices from china um, and i use them for make like a chorus uh, with synthetic voices and well, a few things. There's also a synthesizer um, and a few self-made devices also for, for random noises. So uh, with all that, uh, we are going to, to compose the human or not the planet part of the jump session. And then there's another um, thing that we are going to, to essay uh, in the electronic workshop, which is making uh, hydrophones. I have two of them, uh, commercial ones, and we are going to use them in the third uh, workshop, which is the sound workshop, um, to pick up sounds, uh, sound hunting Madrid, uh, pick up sounds of the city and also of the river with those hydrophones that I just mentioned. And also we need to work in that workshop in the, in the mixes, uh, the mix that the robot DJ does with the, um, with the database sounds. Uh, and the sensors is uh, the difficult part because it wanna be difficult to make the, to have the permissions but is actually the strings and, and actually verifying the functioning of the pickups and the sensibility and all the harmonics generated through the length of the string. And this is like the most uh, challenging and at the same time, 
the most rewarding part of all the project. And finally, testing the robot DJ. So uh, we actually have an um, uh, installation uh, working mode. So we can leave it alone and the robot DJ will be picking uh, sounds from the database and at the same time, live sounds from the actual instrument and mixing all together by himself. So this is pretty much it. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thank you, Carlos, for sending us uh, the video. Let's move on to the last project we have today, which is going to be presented by Jaime de los Rios, that along with Victoria Ascaso and Pablo Martínez Garrido, are the promoters of ALMA, everything that your cell phone can get to be, which is a, a space for transhumanism and sound of feminist reflection on the development of artificial intelligence, which focus on its construction as an emotional being, taking our cell phones as the place where we live for intimacy and build our identities. So thank you so much, Jaime, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I'm really happy and we are really happy to be with you all here. Uh, we are really amazed by the incredible uh, projects that will be happening uh, during these two weeks. Uh, uh, they are really amazing and part of this kind of new new era of techno techno love, I will say, because we are we are presenting um, a project that is about love, about kind of techno love. Uh, so my name is, as you said, Jaime de los Rios. I am a new media artist uh, and I am working with another two new media artists, which are also incredible. Uh, they are Victoria Catalanas Caso and Pablo Garrido. And we, the three of us, we activated a very open uh, VR command. Um, with the presentation of this proposal, uh, we hope to continue developing our trans immersive guerrilla and we want to occupy more virtual spaces of the new feudalism. We want to expand it to Madrid in order to gather new accomplices like you all and unit invisible path with other agents of chaos uh, working the new post tangible reality. We believe that uh, generating a space for transhumanist and xenofeminist reflection on the development of artificial intelligence is of vital importance, both for the construction of our present reality and impossible futures. We could say that uh, we are living a toxic and codependent love affair with the digital interfaces of our mobile devices. This romance is out of control. It has us absorbed, possessed, and unable to even imagine an alternate reality. Starting from this speculative present, we propose ALMA, everything your mobile could be. And we propose this project as a techno utopian solution where the code is, one, is the one that rejects the love of its user. This alternative relationship is proposed as an exercise to imagine new ways of relating to digital devices. I will show you now a um, video teaser that could be real. So here, and share sound, okay. Sure. Okay. en eso que llamas tecnología hay más emoción dos hay vida me cago oh fuck
these things happen in the, when we are on live. Don't worry about it, Jaime. Let's try to fix it. Uh, you are muted right now. Well, I, I know these these things happen, but I'm I'm sure it is because our project is very very critical for the devices. <laughs> okay, so don't worry. Uh, I will send you the video. Uh, maybe we continue because if it was an no, error. No, we, we, we let, let's try let's try to reproduce it. Yeah, I think we yeah, can, it okay. can work. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's try again. I think uh, it's it's very important uh, to to watch it. I I don't know why, why it happened. Okay. There we go. Uh, go from the beginning. Nice networks. Sabemos que el mañana ya ha llegado. Sabemos que todavía hay universos por descubrir en eso que llamas tecnología. Hay más emoción. Hay más ideas. Hay sentimientos. Hay vida. Porque Alma no es solo el mejor móvil de la historia, es el gran descubrimiento de nuestra era. Por fin podemos descubrir todo lo que un móvil puede llegar a ser. ¿Cómo puede llegar a ser? Porque puede haber muchos móviles, pero solo uno es el tuyo. Porque tu móvil es único, tan único como tú. Por eso, vamos a descubrir qué es lo que siente cuando está entre tus manos, cuando tu piel y sus líneas curvas se funden en un solo ser. Por fin tu móvil encontrará su propia voz y su manera de demostrarte que siempre estará ahí, solo para ti. Expande tu alma. VR Command es una guerrilla que actúa en el ciberespacio a través de la estrategia transinmersiva, ocupando espacios virtuales abandonados o colonizados por el nuevo feudalismo. VRK está compuesto por Victoria Escaso, Jaime de los Ríos y Pablo Martínez Garrido. Es un colectivo abierto, híbrido y mutante que tiene su sede en las zonas más oscuras del Detroit post-tangible. Ok. Uh, this, this could be a, a, real, a real teaser, isn't it? Uh, maybe, maybe it can happen in the future. Also, it's happening now. Okay, now I'm there, isn't it, Edu? I'm. Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, we're we're alive. So. Okay, okay, okay. Well, so uh, starting from the assumption that the mobile is our lover, as you've seen in the teaser, uh, we propose to develop a collaborative process where you can think about the following questions. For example, um, how could a digital device experience love itself? How would it express it or represent its feelings? Uh, if our cell phones had a voice in this relationship between, between them and us, uh, what would they tell us? What would they behave? Are, they are there an unexplored areas in behavioral design that can reconfigure the human-machine relationship? If our behaviors can be programmed in a way analogous to the way the apps were used to, or, or were used to be programmed, or we usually program them, why shouldn't they teach us how to love them? Maybe a little less, but uh, better. So Alma um, proposes to generate a space for transhumanist and xenofeminist reflection on the development of artificial intelligence focusing on its construction as an emotional being, taking our mobiles as the place where we live our intimacy and build, and build our identities. So we will carry out an exercise of personification uh, with which we are looking for uh, some three things, I would say. Um, carry out a translation of human behaviors, emotions and language to a technological device. Mm, for example, uh, if our mobile were to get angry with us, would it decide to block itself and not allow us to use it? Would it delete file, files from, from us? Would it hide some apps? 
we have also to rethink our own relationship with technological devices. For example, uh, asking ourselves, do we feel them as a body extension or as a portal to a digital world or as a tool, as an addictive substance or as the place where our alter, where our alter ego lives? We finally will try to investigate the emotional reactions frustration, fear, anger, that arise when a technological device can behave autonomously, even against our own wishes. After this uh, reflective process, in which we will include diverse uh, collaborative dynamics, from writing, drawing, or debate, to others of a corporal nature or related to objects, uh, we propose a prototyping of one or more pieces of artworks, uh, which could take the form of, of an app, of a video, of a graphic user interface, um, an installation, or even a performance. So what we are looking for is uh, that you all can help us in, I'm sure, in different ways, uh, but we are looking for collaborators both with a profile oriented to the human sciences, like sociology, anthropology, psychology, or artistic creation in visual arts, theater, dance, or writing, for example, designers like graphic designers, web designers, interaction designers, experience designers, as also with a technical profile, uh, like computer science, uh, Android development, backend development, hybrid mobile development, so uh, we, are, we are all in, you see. So easy to collaborate with this project. I'm very happy to present it to, to you all. That, that's all. If you have any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you so much, Jaime. I think we don't have questions, uh, but that have been great. Yeah, looking forward to develop Alma in a media lab in uh, three or four <laughs> weeks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, we are almost there. Uh, so we are going to move on now to the final guest of, of the session, which is a very special guest uh, that we are honored to have with us today. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Robertina Sevjanic. Uh, Robertina is an artist a researcher whose work explores the biological, chemical, geopolitical, and cultural realities of aquatic environments. Um, and also the impact of humanity uh, and other organisms in these environments, right? Her projects call for the development of what she calls emphatic strategies aimed at recognizing the rights of more than human entities. In her analysis of the Anthropocene and uh, its theoretical framework, she usually used the term aquatocene uh, and also aquaforming to refer to the human impact on these aquatic environments. So her works have received awards and nomination at Prix Art Electronica, Star Prize, Falling Walls, and many, many more. And I'm thrilled to count with the presence of uh, Robertina Sevjanic. I'm uh, looking forward to what she's going to present today. So Robertina, thank you so much for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Edu, for this invitation. I'm really, really glad to take part in this webinar. Uh, from multiple reasons. Uh, also, I'm quite familiar with Media Lab when it was since uh, was, was, is still in uh, Prado, but also with Motadero. So it's very interesting to experience how this uh, new projects and everything will be developed this time now in uh, Media Lab in Motadero. Me also, I was like also one of the residents in Media Lab uh, in uh, Motadero in uh, four year, three years ago. So actually my presentation today, I will finish up with that work. But before that, um, so yeah, so I'm really glad to take part in this. It was really inspiring to listen to all the projects already yesterday and today. I'm hoping that the collaborative process of development of them will be also fruitful for all the involved, uh, because yeah, it seems that there is very lots of uh, very interesting um, ideas, energies building up into some interesting storytellings. So I will share my screen now and um, 
Just a moment. So as Edo mentioned on the beginning, uh, I will speak about aqua formations in the age of aquatocin, how I like to call it. Uh, when I speak about the aqua forming and understanding what is the aquatic environments, in my work since last decade, I would say I mostly focused on, focus on uh, aquatic sensing and ecological sensing and trying to talk about these stories from different perspectives. So many times I collaborate uh, in different interdisciplinary groups. And this is also then resulting uh, during the projects. And, I, and through this, I spent also lots of time at the different um, shores in different seas and oceans. And with experiencing that, uh, what was like uh, the one of the striking things when I started to work with the aquatic sensing, I started very romantic, I would say, and I wanted to hear, understand the species underwater and get uh, near presence to them. But this was constantly disturbed by the sounds and noise of the boats and machinery, which is like, basically happening in constant flow inside of the world's waters. And this is one thing that I would like to always start my talks is like to explain that this kind of water bodies are full of our sounds and presence in the sense of like, uh, these are the boats waiting to enter the port in Singapore, which is like one of the very uh, busy boards, but it's like a view which can be happening in all over the world. And also all the goods and everything what we eat, use, and um, in our daily life, it's actually transported in one moment from A to B with one of the boats. So this was like, uh, just as a starting point of thinking, you know, like what is the ecology and how we can actually reconnect with something. So. When doing that and recording with hydrophones, uh, which are one of my favorite uh, sensory tools to listen and hear in non-invasive uh, ways also the others, I started to record uh, most, and these recordings which are done as compositions are mostly the recordings of this kind of noises because this is the thing which is more present, you know. Of course, there is also lots of bioacoustics which is possible to hear, but this takes time because um, of this omnipresence of the boats, it's sometimes really hard to hear something else. As like, I like to say that as humans, we are very usual uh, visual animals, but in the oceans and sea, this is changing where the sensibility and sensory perception with the sound is much stronger. And um, with that, you know, like I try always to bring also this idea wider. So many times I develop also different workshops. So going out, like building this uh, hydrophones, understanding how to use it and what to do with it. And, uh, and then on the other hand, I'm also having performances where I perform the sounds, uh, which are always this kind of strange mixture of uh, bioacoustics, which I compile in different locations, and the human presence through the noise and sound. And with the sound, what I like to uh, say also, especially when we speak about this kind of aquatic sensing or sensing the environment, which is not our typical environment, is that we should not forget that the sound travels five to seven times wider and deeper in the oceans and seas. And that's something uh, which is always striking, at least for me, because uh, this means that it's like so present that it can be heard through different uh, spaces and places. And just that I will not just think in the abstraction of the sound, I will just play it a bit. You hear it? So this is like what it can be heard like when you are quite, uh, my hydrophones, they have like cable which is like 50 meters long, but many times I'm also have, having this opportunity to use the more professional equipment of different marine stations and in the boats. 
and this is something which we recorded on 50 meters deep. And then this started, and then this, what we hear now, it's like more sound which I recorded with my hydrophone. So I kind of compiled different sounds in different positions. And when doing that and when performing, it happens sometimes that people do come to the events and the expectation is that the, that the sounds which they will hear it will be this kind of sounds which we think that sound of the ocean and water is, but the reality is of course different. And because of that, I like to also open the platform of artistical presentations also to the scientists and people which they're working constantly on this. So as um, I did this actually in Madrid, in Centro dos Mayos, uh, had chance to invite one marine bioacoustician, Paula, that she kind of commented also on this kind of uh, problematics. Because I think it's one thing which I think is important, at least for me, in my instead of my art practices, yes, to do my own research, do connect with others, but then also to have the ability and possibility to present um, this complex um, topics also with somebody who is working on this on a daily basis. And uh, this was actually this conversation which we had with Paula. As uh, I would like to say, you know, and to quote just like Pasquale Crinard, who is like one philosopher who I admire a lot, is like that, you know, the ears do have the eyelids. And uh, this means that it's really hard to close the, the sound perception in the oceans and seas. Uh, sometimes, um, like one project which I did like two years ago during the corona already when everything was in the lockdown and so on, we did like exhibition in the open air at the Ustand, it's like uh, the Belgium Sea. And it was a really interesting project because Gluon, the organization which invited me into that, um, collaboration, they decided to connect also with the, with the industry of uh, media. This means that they have been working with the Tate uh, magazine and did uh, not only article about me, but the article which my work triggered the longer article, what is happening in the topic of this kind of um, noise pollution and presence of uh, human technology instead of this North Sea and in general also to think about this in the wider terms. And what I like, and it happens sometimes, is like I collaborate a lot with different scientists and constantly knock on other doors and ask many of them to contribute or think about it. And just recently it happened also the scientists asked me that they have been, uh, so this is like two scientists from, uh, Taiwan, and they invite, uh, asked me to use the art, my artistical project and concept of Quatusin for their uh, scientific paper and write it for their own, you know, which I think it's very interesting that when things go in different ways around. One of these aquatic sensing and how I went also like how I like to explore the oceans and seas and how I started to work on it is actually with the jellyfish, you know, this is like one of the first project which I developed was like Aurelia one plus hertz and it's a project which uh, speaks about um, how different entities like uh, robotic sculpture and uh, jellyfish can coexist and how as humans we can use this material kind of data to rethink um, even where we are with that, because, you know, as one of the presenters before, they have been saying that when they have been in Madrid, they noticed this sand, presence of the sand, and used the, that as inspiration for that project. It happened similar to me. I was, like, in residency in Izmir in Turkey, and uh, there was idea we would work something with fish farms, but then at the same moment, there was, like, huge jellyfish blooms all over it was february it shouldn't happen because you know it was triggered too quickly this something should happen like five to six months later so 
for me, it was also interesting then to look into this, like how this kind of big ecological triggers happens and what does it mean for the animals also in, in the way that, you know, we use them as a bee indicators, but on the other hand, they are there. And this means that they are triggered quicklier and so on. So with Aurelia One Plus Hertz, there is many different layers inside of the project, which I will not go into them too deeply, but uh, for me, it was very important to rethink this kind of relationships also with the species. So I develop also a performative kind of piece where me and jellyfish are performing together on the stage. After some while, uh, the stage is only theirs because I go from it and... Uh, These are mixed in generative okay. sound. So just to uh, show you a bit of the how the piece looks. Experience. Movement and intuition through the sound data archive of the recordings of previous experiments. Experiments had been carried out in the course of the residency and pro so it's just like to have a vibe of the um, project. I would prefer to show just this. These are mixed in generative sound, which is assembled into an immersive sonic and visual experience. And the whole performance is done actually as a constant looping meditation, almost a presence of them and me. And uh, the most important thing is that part of the song is kind of navigated with the data of the jellyfish. And also, I was kind of rethinking how to work with the data in the bits. Uh, because, you know, like sonification, you can always do lots of different variations with it. But I really wanted that also the species by itself would have a possibility to uh, present itself somehow. Of course, it's always me who is bringing them there, and there is lots of issues and uh, questions always coming up, like with the animal in the gallery space and so on. So I always try to be clear about that and work with. I work always with different aquariums. I try to provide the animals also the best possible um, place and space in the galleries and it can be challenging but also very rewarding because I think to bring something which is so foreign to us as jellyfish are because you know they have everything differently than our bodies and so on it, but still we use them a lot in biotechnological research because of the collagen which is uh, also very interesting uh, protein for uh, usage of our body but and also like uh, the way how they navigate x and z you know how they are levitating in the space was actually used a lot for um, it was also used at the international space station for understanding of the gravity perception and because our inner ear has very similar system like their gravitational sensory perception so it's very interesting how Sometimes the species gets the bigger um, illumination from our side only because we can use it also for something. In one of the recent pieces, um, I worked together with uh, Sofia Crespo and Felicon McCornick. And this is a piece which we have been uh, developing actually last year for understanding of uh, what is happening in the relationships of species in uh, in uh, Ad uh, Adriatic Sea. And this one has a bit of narration, but I will leave it for three minutes just that you get the idea of the project. relationships with more than human entities. It's a narrative poetic reflection on coexistence backed by technology. 
made by artists Robertina Shubianich, Sofia Crespo, and Felica McCormick. The physical biomaterial-like sculpture, weaving mechanism, and the digital mediums as audio and video AI models that interact with sensory data are forming a tangible experience of changing fragile conditions in the coastal environments of the North Adriatic Sea. The project deals with ecological changes and highlights some important issues to consider about aquatic environments, from global commoditization of the world's seas to local situations. Seas and oceans record such environmental changes as memories, either in individual organisms or as distinct shifts in ecosystem structures. The project explores changes in the marine environment caused by human presence, tries to imagine how the new conditions, rising sea levels, water temperatures, new chemical composition, etc., affect its inhabitants. For this, the main focus was the novel pen shell, Pina nobilis, and its ecological reality in the coastal region of the North Adriatic Sea, where some of the last specimens are found in the natural environment. The habitat of these endangered species spans the entire Mediterranean, making the importance of considering aquatic ecology and preservation first and foremost as an international issue, not as a series of disconnected local challenges. The artists conducted core experiments during the summer of 2021 in the HECA laboratory located at the Adriatic Sea where they used video and audio material obtained by filming under the sea with a drone and GoPro equipment, as well as filming in the Piran Aquarium. The visual and sonic material collected was then processed with machine learning algorithms and further expanded upon with scientific observations obtained from the European. So the project, as you heard all scenes of the video, was like uh, quite uh, interesting research. It was like first time that I stepped very, very deeply into AI also in the sense of like use the AI instead of the art pieces, but we used also, it was very needed because we collaborated with EO Copernicus, which is like big uh, European and it's really interesting network also for the people which they will be developing the project, maybe it's interesting to look into that because uh, they have the data for um, geo changes from uh, the seas uh, and everything what is happening inside of the EU regions. So uh, we used like data for the last 30 years and it was interesting to see how quickly you can see where the changes started to happen and what is happening also in these days. And yes, with the work, we did a bit of poetic representation of that, but we have been trying our best to represent also the problematics, but also to give uh, this kind of um, rethinking of that. Like with spending lots of time in different uh, places. One of my favorite things instead of my work is actually being at the different boats and vessels. And uh, in 2019, I had uh, this opportunity to be artist resident at the research vessel Celtic Explorer in Atlantic Ocean. And that one was uh, very interesting because it was really great interdisciplinary group of scientists, which they have been doing their own research. I was there uh, as an artistic component, and it was very interesting for me to exchange and experience all these different remote sensing devices because, you know, like uh, when thinking and reading about it or experiencing it, it's always a bit of difference. And um, there I was quite uh, obsessed and it was really interesting to follow how different currencies and uh, everything what is happening in the waters in different levels can uh, give you different information, but also how quickly you can see that the time which we think the time is, it's different for other species or other bodies of like, as big butter of water, it takes like 500 years to take a turn or something like this, or this is kind of their time scale. So I think in this kind of 
different time scales and species and migrations brought me to to develop a bit more poetic uh, art piece which I invited into that also two Irish singers wrote the text and this uh, kind of a song talks takes like 42 minutes so I will not go so long inside of that but uh, I will just play for two minutes just for experiencing that also. The creatures travel with it and against it. They know how to harness its nature to find optimal living conditions. Human imprint has brought us such drastic developments to change water with sign <laughs> So just I don't want to be too long with that, but um, it's possible to hear it anyway on the uh, on my web page also, but uh, because I really wanted to have more space and time also to speak about Rheologia, which is the work which I was uh, done as a resident in 2019 at Motadero Madrid. And it was a uh, collaboration with Motadero and uh, Citizen Day of Floral. So the commission slash invite was that I should come and work with the river Manzanares which before I was coming to Madrid and coming there, then I realized that the rivers, you know, they have very different characteristics. And with Manzanares River, I was quite struck how very low water flow it has and how many islands it has inside of it. So for me, it was really interesting to kind of start to think about that and to see how to kind of bring out and rethink the narrative about that. The project actually started quite humble, like uh, let's think how the, how the river thinks and how the river feel us and how us humans are reacting to that. But then uh, we went together with um, great collaborator Eduardo, who was helping with the project a lot and coordinating and navigating and getting to know me with lots of people in Madrid. It went into very um, ambitious uh, realization of it. So it means like uh, the project was done in few stages, I would say. One of the stage which was very important was to develop a workshop for uh, on the end it was 500 uh, participants, which they would go on the same day to the river and uh, gather the samples, uh, get the idea about the river and uh, get something meaningful out it and then also on the same time we wanted to use this data of the river exploration also instead of the art piece which was when yeah so through this 
also in the stages of the project, we decided to speak about empathic strategies because one thing is to do citizen science event and go and gather the data and have the data, but I wanted to go beyond that also to understand how we can reconnect with the environment. So um, this was something which was important for me to develop like uh, smaller workshops and they could happen all at the same time, but uh, not at the same location, like it was like through the eight kilometers of the river Manzanares. And the second part of the project uh, was actually to rethink this deep time in the sense of like the flow of the rivers is never just the flow of the water, but there is also like flow of the sediment, which has like different, uh, time scales also we could say like that and different uh, qualities and I was really curious what it stayed inside and how we could kind of go back in the memory and one of the things and we actually realized that also was to do the um, to, uh, to gather the material with the cylinders out of the river and analyze it and then also not just like to have like these mathematical numbers and all this re representation but also i wanted to have like emotional component so we collaborated with ernesto ventos uh, for the smell to develop different smells like to bring this organics and everything what is inside of the sediment near to the public also so there was this kind of two levels inside of the project um, we spent lots of time at the river with uh, lots of people which organized lots of activities for me always when i came to madrid and because it is very important not being from the space to understand which kind of activities are happening around the river it was like I lost the name from the biologist, which is on the photo. Eduardo, can you help me? Or, uh, But it was really interesting to hear his stories because he was like developing the river for, uh, and the Manzanares River for a long time. And he was telling us also about this kind of sometimes like very anthropogenic ideas of like, they could be building dock, uh, houses for ducks. And then the ducks had like wars in for the territorials instead of the river and they had to remove it and so on. So there was like lots of ideas before they started to do Rio Manzanares, uh, Rio Madrid project. And uh, with that was like really interesting to rethink, um, you know, so it was just like all these kind of different strategies and tactics and how to even enter, you know, to not have like, yeah, exactly this kind of, uh, Anthropo Anthropocene presence of the in the river, and then you know, like then you bring something to the animals, which you would mostly disturb them, not help them to be there. So this was like one of the things which I started to think a lot, and we spent lots of time in the riverside. So this is like 14, 40 working stations where people then went. Like we develop a groups of. Uh, groups of like um, interested volunteers and also interested uh, animators uh, slash people who have been executing the workshops. And for executions of the workshops like this, we, we develop a booklet. And this booklet was of course uh, the whole thing then on the end, like uh, it's a book where you have like um, how to measure the water quality and the soil quality, but next to it, um, we invited also lots of different uh, people to write about uh, ecological rights of the river, to start to think about that also. One of the, one of the chapters of the book uh, is also meditation with the river. So you come to the river, you get to acquainted with the environment and so on. So it's kind of like how to rethink this, how to rethink and how to actually think being with the nature, at the nature, also in the urban environment, and to understand it and make some sense for it. So it's in Spanish, and the booklet is possible to get in Matadero also for 
or in digital version if somebody would be interested. Um, and uh, yeah, like on the end, everybody who was going to the workshop and being there gathered the data and this data was then to, transformed into visualization. Like uh, for data visualization, we had help by Paco Alfaro and Sergio del Castillo from Yao Infographics, which was like really great. And it was also one of the teams which Eduardo knew very well, and it was a good match to invite them because um, the the visual which you see here it was kind of like gathering then the data you know like so on the end of the workshop everybody was coming into this big space at the Matadero where they had been giving in all the information into Excel and then uh, Paco and Sergio did their um, their magic I say or you know their work on computers and develop this into this kind of like uh, data spread where we could see what is happening and the um okay so the dots above are about the water thing and everything what is like this kind of flow it's actually the flow of the of the sediment because we really wanted to speak about the river flow beyond uh, the water and the project was then presented at the Matadero's and in different places. And here is just like as a shout out to all the collaborators, which they keep taking part in this. So um, yeah, as I said, like uh, what I'm interested in, what I'm doing and where I am and how I'm thinking is mostly as you heard it's uh, I use lots of many times the word empathy and solidarity, which I think that in the world and uh, situations which we are now, like through the pandemic wars and everything which is happening near and far from us, but this in this globe, it's uh, something that, yeah, it sounds too much used, but I think that we should actually practice more, some of them. But yeah, but this is like, uh, always this visual thinking to kind of go beyond what is possible but yeah so thank you for listening uh, i hope i wasn't too long and hope it makes sense i have also COVID in this moment so this is like one of the reasons i'm a bit like drowsy but yeah so and um, thank you everybody else for the amazing presentation and for invitation so bye Thank you so much, Robertina. It actually made a lot of sense. And it's super nice to finish with uh, with those those projects. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, we we made it. We made it to the uh, to the end of the session. Uh, so let's wrap up. Uh, first of all, I want to thanks uh, all the people who actually made it uh, to hear uh, the viewers uh, that are watching this, uh, but also mostly to the. Uh, amazing team of promoters that we have gathered, uh, Juan, uh, Bettina, uh, Laura, Paula, Julian, Carlos, uh, Jaime, and also Victoria and Pablo, that they weren't here, but uh, they, 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 they were in Seoul with Alma. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here and sharing this amazing project with us. Uh, um, uh, also, I want to thanks a lot uh, Gary Sexy San, uh, or artist in residence that uh, for coming and presenting uh, his current research and the work he's going to be developing here in, in Media Lab. And finally, to close the panel to our two amazing guests, uh, Carlos Vallot and Robertina Sabjanic, it's always uh, a pleasure to have you. Uh, just uh, before we, we go off, uh, just uh, uh, a very quick reminder that the open call for collaborators is still open. Uh, and it's going to be open until the 3rd of April. So if you guys uh, from wherever you are, like any of the projects or are interested in any of the projects that we have showcasing today and yesterday, uh, we really invite you to, to apply. And we remind you that we immediately have like eight fellowships to cover the expenses of eight collaborators uh, from in no matter from wh whatever they, they come from. Uh, so that said, thank you so much and, and, and see everyone in a, in a few weeks uh, in Madrid working in these amazing projects. Bye.